So, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Dino Esposito. I do a bit of work for JetBrains. Uh, JetBrains is a company that has uh, a lot of tools across the, the huge spectrum of the in software industry for Java and for .NET. But this talk has nothing, really nothing to do with, uh, with uh, JetBrains as a company and uh, uh, my work for, for that. This talk is about uh, misconceptions or misperceptions about the domain-driven design. Uh, the subtitle says uh, common assumptions and uncommon facts about domain-driven design. So let me briefly summarize what has been my epiphany to domain-driven design. Uh, well, if I have to, 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 to summarize what is my job, also encouraged by people, I would say I'm a guru. And uh, the problem, the main problem that gurus have is just sell themselves to companies, to uh, publishers, uh, to conference organizers. So from time to time, uh, you have the problem of finding you know, new things to be able to discuss, to present to people. So I started over 10 years ago, more or less at the time uh, in which Eric Evans okay, published the Blue Book, which is the, the seminal work, piece of work about the domain driven design. Uh, started taking a look into this. It took me years to figure out a few things, but it was only recently, so I would say a year ago, that I you know, encouraged and after talking to friends more active than me probably in the physical writing and management of projects, that I started you know, realizing that that was uh, something to be you know, fixed about the common perception that most people have about DDD. But actually, the first and most important person, individual, who recognized that the common perceptions about DDD were not exactly right was the author, the creator, the inventor of DDD, Eric Evans himself. Uh, if you go on YouTube, uh, it's very easy, just like Eric Evans, DDD, QCon, uh, uh, in a talk that he gave uh, in London, here in London in 2009, at the QCon conference, uh, uh, Eric Evans uh, confessed, so to say, that if, we had, if he had to rewrite the book, he would shift around a few chapters, so put a few chapters at the very top, at the very beginning of the book, giving those chapters more emphasis just to, in summary, shift a little bit the focus, same content, same concepts, but just order differently to deliver a significantly different message to the masses. And uh, essentially, this is the same point that years later, humbly, I'm here to share with you. So we're talking about uh, what is the essence of domain-driven design, why? We should be highly interested in that, assumptions and facts, uh, and uh, the part of DDD that really shines, the analytical part of DDD. So DDD stands for Domain Driven Design, but essentially too often we mistake that for just writing an object model. So instead it's about design of a domain, uh, of a yeah, of a piece of software driven by the physical business domain we observe and analyze. What's the DDD? Domain Driven Design, the blue book from Eric Evans. So it went out some 10 years ago. Uh, and it was a milestone because uh, as the subtitle of the book says, it was supposed to give guidance step by step, extremely well-defined guidance on how to tackle complexity right in the heart of software. Uh, the book contains innovative guidelines, 
So it says something that nobody had said before, original in this regard, about design software driven by the characteristics of the business domain, because we write software just to mimic a piece of real world. We are copycatting in a way. And the challenge is uh, in just making the verb copycat to be real with uh, as little friction as possible between what we observe in the real world, what people involved in the business say, how these people call the entities and the actions in the business, and the copy that we create via software, via C Sharp, C++, Java, whatever. The language is totally irrelevant in this regard in, um, in software. But uh, past the two points here, uh, in the end, uh, DDD was essentially perceived as, uh, over the years as an all or nothing approach. So either you do DDD, which means uh, you literally follow the guidelines Step one, done, 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 just ticking off a list of prescriptions with uh, not much interpretation. So it was taken probably too much religiously. And, uh, well, in the end, things worked, but not so great, not as great as uh, they could. The purpose of domain driven design was uh, mitigating the burden of writing software under, especially under tough conditions. And which are tough conditions? When you have, first point, a huge number of business rules to handle. Not any piece of software, honestly, has that many business rules. So if you have 10, 20 business rules to take care of, it's not a big deal, honestly. But when business rules are, you know, uh, form an interrelated web of rules, one touching on top of the other. And uh, when the number, the total number, grows up to hundreds, it's going to be, you know, complex. And uh, complex doesn't mean you are unable to handle that. But you need prescriptions. You need a clear path to handle a procedure, step by step, right? Uh, another aspect that makes uh, the need of prescriptions relevant is when you have a complex workflows or tasks. So when the business is full, the business domain is full of actions, business actions, that you know form fairly intricate workflows that get even beyond the, the flow of work. If you try to render out using, I don't know, a flowchart diagram, what you have to actually code just to prove yourself as an architect that you've got it right from user requirements, well, you, you find writing a flowchart fairly complicated. And so it requires that you go back and forward with customers interviewing and re-interviewing just to make sure that you got it right. Because the fundamental point of software, the, the challenge of software of all times is just understanding exactly what you're supposed to do. And when you face a scenario where the business is inherently intricate, because it's the real <coughs> world, and trying to formalize it means there are so many hundreds of business rules and tens or even hundreds of entities that populate the domain, without prescriptions, but even with prescriptions, the fundamental thing is understanding the inherent mechanics of things, how things work. So becoming a domain expert. Uh, you, you are a software architect. I am a software architect. We are architects. So we are not strictly expected to become domain experts in all possible domains in the world. But uh, understanding the mechanics or just having, ensuring that the mechanics of things that you understand is right, is valid, is approved, this is absolutely critical. And this is the, the whole thing that really matters about DDD. Collaborative systems are, if I have to provide a class of applications, the 
probably the most sophisticated and complex we can write. A collaborative system is a system in which many users typically work concurrently on subsets of data and data change under your eyes. As the user is editing or working or displaying some data, some other users concurrently may perform actions that invalidate or modify the data being displayed. Another scenario, more modern, this day's scenario is uh, that makes uh, architecting a system hard is when you don't know, your customers actually don't know exactly what they want. Because uh, startups are the prominent, the most prominent example. Because uh, typically a startup is uh, a nice idea, hopefully a winner idea, but just an idea. So with a business plan behind, uh, with uh, yeah, some uh, relatively faint uh, ideas, uh, with some uh, concrete pillars, uh, but not all pillars in place. And you have to help them to shape up the final artifact that is deployed, delivered to the market for success or failure. So when you work in a startup context, you, only, you, you cannot expect that users give you specific, full details about requirements. You, you, you as an architect are part of the, of the team and you have to help okay, um, stakeholders, the company, to understand what they want. So in the end, the, the, the final model, the final <coughs> result of the analysis has to be something that makes sense common sense. But what is uh, what I see to be the way in which most people would summarize domain-driven design is, okay, just build an object model that represents the business domain. Okay, let's call it domain model. It's an object model, right? But uh, to be cool, you call it the domain model. And, well, and then you build around this uh, domain model just a layered architecture, which is just another way you can call the classic three-tier architecture that we built for decades now. Presentation, business, data. It's more or less the same, right? Just call it with a different name. A little bit more abstract, but essentially the same thing. This is, of course, <coughs> a little bit oversimplifying. But no, not that this is wrong. But this is just one instance. One, it, it's not the truth, the absolute truth. It's just one way of instancing. It's just like getting a class and creating an instance of that class with uh, values that depend on the particular implementation instance of that class. We are talking about the abstract class, not instances. This is just one instance of DDD. Right, wrong, it's probably the most common, but it's just one instance. That is fundamental. So, if you take this, instead of just an instance of the DDD pattern, if you take this as the truth, the pattern itself, you find out that, well, apparently it's not really hard to do right DDD. But actually, you find out that it's just easier to do it wrong. It's not paradoxical. It's relatively simple. So the, the message is clear build an object model that represents the domain. And everybody can get it. So apparently it's easy. You got it. But turning that into practice starts getting hard. So simple to understand, hard to adopt. So just easier to do it wrong. So if it is a starting point and that is the end point, this is the theory and this is the practice. Okay, let's uh, delve deeper, a bit deeper into the two common assumptions about uh, domain-driven design. Uh, you need to have an object model called domain model that is, fundamental point, agnostic of persistence. And this is the first point that, yeah, in the beginning, scared 
generation of developers? Well, it's understandable because uh, developers, when they approach DDD, uh, because of what they studied at schools, at university, or because of what they have learned along the way working on legacy projects, because of, what, of, of the training they received in companies they worked for, there is the idea that everything must be built up from the bottom, the bottom being a database. So you have a solid relational model, and you build everything on top of that. You, once you have a solid relational model, you can build on top of that just everything. Now, I'm not here to say this is wrong, but this is just one way of doing things. So, you say you need to have an object model agnostic of persistence. Why? An object model represents the data and the behavior, but at some point I need to persist information. So how can I ignore? the database and the characteristics of the database. Now, I think that this sentence is right and wrong at the same time. It depends on the perspective that you look at that. So Eric Evans, in his vision of DDD, was totally right about calling it domain model instead of just object model. It was totally right. And he was totally right in calling out the agnostic point of persistence. You, if you want to understand how it works, the last thing you want to think about is how you save data. The point is understanding how it works. This is a domain model. Not necessarily a bunch of classes. And in fact, these days, the community of DDD is moving this idea farther and dropping objects in favor of functions. Because it's not the objects the key point, it's just one possible way of doing things. The key point is understanding how it works. That is the domain model. And because it tells you how it works, persistence is the last concern you may have. In the moment in which you move from understanding to actual implementation, the database becomes, it's still a detail, but it's an important, relevant detail. Uh, when you physically write code, classes, in the domain model, 90% uh, of the time uh, you have to make changes, reach compromises between the ideal view model you created, the vision of the model you had, abstractly speaking, and uh, you have to mediate that with the uh, characteristics of the tools you use to save data. And, uh, Persistence, in this particular case, is typically delegated to a mapper tool. What's a mapper tool? Oh, okay, it's called ORM. Object Relational Mapper. So mapper tool because it's a tool that maps the model you have abstractly defined into something that typically is relational. But typically, because if you bring in no SQL data stores, it may still be just copy machine, object to object. This is, uh, as I'm trying to express, is uh, the vision of DDD, but object model agnostic of persistence and an ORM, to back it up, are common assumptions that if elevated to the rank of being the pattern, can drive your attention, can, uh, can be misunderstood. Oh, another point here. An object model agnostic of persistence. So in which way a domain model is different from a plain object model? So whenever you have a, a class library in .NET, a jar file, okay, in Java, you just put classes, but the class is nearly the same. It's the same in Java or C++ or just a collection of uh, properties, public, protected, private, and methods. Class is a class. So multiple classes, maybe related together 
in the same class library form an object model. Why should we call it a domain model? Why two, two ways, two different ways to call what appears to be the same thing? So the explanation, wrong, that is taken for this is, well, yes, but a domain model has some extra special aspects and characteristics. Uh, you want to use value types instead of primitives. Oh, really? Yes, because say, for example, you are, I don't know, <coughs> modeling something that involves at some point temperatures. A, a temperature, how would you render a temperature? It, it's a number. Yes, but uh, what, what kind of number? So what is the type you use for render temperature? An integer? Yeah, because it could be negative or positive, so an integer. Yes, but it could be 3 million. 3 million is an integer. Yes, but 3 million, is, is, it's an integer, but it's not probably a feasible value for a temperature. So you need to probably restrict that to a smaller range of integers. But at that point, it, it's no longer an integer. Uh, think of this. When you create uh, an object model or a domain model, you, upon, you understood how it, how it works in the business domain, and you are creating an SDK for uh, other people in your company, yourself, parts of the constituent parts of the architecture to consume. You are exposing the core of the system in much the same way you can use the Android SDK or you can use the iOS SDK, just the, the public interface to program against the model. If you define a temperature as an integer and you have a a public sector property <coughs> on the class that exposes the temperature. Okay, it's correct what you have done, but you are also enabling people to put into the integer property just any value that fits with integer type. So you need to find a way to restrict that. And uh, consider that the history of software is full of examples of projects that failed because of the wrong data fit in some way, slip in some way into the system. Uh, you may have heard about the, it was 96, the Ariane 5 disaster. It was the maiden flight of the Ariane 5 rocket from the European uh, Agency, uh, ESA, uh, of space. Uh, it's easy to find evidence of that in, uh, through Google, but actually the, the, the rocket uh, 40 seconds after takeoff, exploded. It was self-destroyed. So the same software running the rocket decided after 40 seconds, no, 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 no. I'm out of orbit. Boom. It's safer for me to self-destroy. The logic in the software received data that made the logic, the algorithm think that rocket was out of orbit. So, if the rocket was going out of orbit, set this point was a safe option. The problem was that a module was an exception in a, in a number conversion that was not handled properly, made the, the, the exception bubble up unhandled when it reached the module that was uh, control, in control of the orbit, he received incongruent numbers, determined from that it was out of orbit and self-destroyed the module. So this is to say that not putting boundaries about uh, values and types you use in the model, not modeling faithfully what you see in the real world, may take <coughs> to disaster hopefully not disaster like the Ariane 5 uh, blow up, but disasters, no, loss of money or time or whatever. So value types are the pattern that says avoid using primitives, or any time you find yourself using an integer, a string, a data boolean, make sure that you really need there an integer, a boolean, whatever it is. So don't be afraid of rendering a temperature with its own type. Temperature type, which happens to be a value type, so just an immutable 
type to, to use the .NET language. Factories, instead of constructors. Now, a factory does exactly the same <coughs> job as a constructor. They create new up instances of the type, but a constructor has no name. It can have a, a different signature. So you can have as many constructors as you want, as long as each has a different, physically different signature. But you have a no clue. When you see new, my class, and five parameters in a row, and then you have another new, my class, and another five parameters of different types, both are absolutely legal instructions. But they don't tell you much about the reason why at that point you are initializing the code. So if you read it back a week later, even if you wrote that code yourself, it can be not easy to figure out what you were doing. Say, who's the idiot who wrote this? Me, oh my god. So factories are just constructors, except that they can be given a name, a name that tells you clearly, express much, much better, why you are getting a new instance of that class at that point of your code. Private sectors. Again, the same story that I made a moment ago about temperatures. Uh, when you assign a value to a public property, uh, the type is uh, typically the only automatic control boundary you put around that. You cannot assign a Boolean value to an integer, but an integer can accept any value in the range of two billion, minus two billions, I think, up to two billions. So private setter gives you, or just a, set, a, a, a setter with logic inside, allows you to control the process of assigning a value. And then methods. The core, if you read again the Eric, Eric Evans book, the part on the main model, it's all about methods. He said, okay, methods. I want to have methods. Fine, I want methods. But what, I, what does it mean, methods? I have properties. I prefer to have getters, getter and setters. <coughs> methods, oh, ah, the business logic, yes. But the business logic at some point ends up working with databases. And the same Eric told me that I need to have a model agnostic of databases. So, so what's the point? And you end up not having methods. So, Practical effects of uh, domain driven design are it's not so easy to build a model, full fledged model that fully represents the domain. Some people did it good, some other people did it bad. Everybody had some type of troubles. <coughs> but no matter this, however you want to frame it, DDD, however, represented a significant lot <coughs> in software development. It took root originally in the Java space because the Java space compared to the .NET space, I think it was uh, five years ahead. So people, companies investing in Java started doing this in mid-90s, far before the .NET framework made justice of having a different language for particular features. Uh, as it was the case in the Microsoft space, and uh, DDD was blissfully ignored until recently in the .NET space, and then when adopted, kind of misunderstood. Now, this is a quote uh, from uh, my latest book, uh, Architecting Applications for the Enterprise, but uh, the guy who said that is uh, one of the Microsoft Corp people uh, that work closely with companies, with Microsoft, shops to build enterprise class architecture. So he says, we shouldn't try to lead with a unique top level architecture that addresses any application or subsystem. A single architecture that rules them all is not a good idea for complex enterprise software. So this puts the end the final word, the crooks on the <coughs> grave of the idea that on the previous slide, a full fledged model is the way to go. So what does it mean? Does this mean that it is totally, completely wrong? Useless? No. <coughs> DDD has two distinct parts. You always need one. 
and you can sometimes totally, happily ignore the other. <coughs> the most important part is the analytical part in DDD, and then there is the strategic part. The analytical part is just valuable to everybody in every project because it allows you to figure out the top level architecture of the system. The strategic is about how you actually implement the parts you identified in the top level architecture. And in the original formulation of DDD in the Eric Evans book, there is just one recommended supporting architecture. That is all about having a domain model, so an object model to represent the mechanics of the system, and the domain model inserted in a layered architecture with four layers, presentation, application, which is where you have uh, uh, the workflows, essentially, for each use case, the domain layer, which is made of two parts, the domain model, agnostic of database, and domain services, so the services that know about, that are invoked from the application, from the workflows, orchestrated, and that know about the database to make objects be materialized <laughs> and saved. And then at the end, the infrastructure, whatever that means. For sure, it contains uh, repositories and uh, data access code. So conducting analysis of a domain, business domain, using domain-driven design, the pattern, is about doing, um, understanding, figuring out two key points. One is ubiquitous language, which is essentially a vocabulary, a glossary of terms that is the language of the business. Uh, ubiquitous language is a fancy name to indicate the real language, the real dictionary vocabulary spoken by people involved in that business, if that's the case, in that company. So when you talk to people, when you process user requirements, that user requirements are written using terms from this ubiquitous language, except that the ubiquitous language doesn't exist, it's not formalized. Uh, and the role, the job of the architect is just letting the glossary emerge clearly from requirements. So the more you understand and figure out and make sense how requirements, the more you take out of row requirements, keywords, nouns, verbs, and build a, a glossary. This means that, this means that, this means that. That's it. Now. Once defined, maybe also in part, the ubiquitous language, so the nouns and verbs in this glossary, should, must be used in all forms of spoken and written communication. It's the official language of the project. <coughs> okay. Okay, this is key. It's not, oh, yeah, it's a fundamental point. And uh, after this, bounded contents. I said that the primary purpose of DDD is letting the top level architecture emerge. So, okay, in practice, it means that as you start processing requirements and taking note of terms that play a key role in the, in the language, it may be that at some point you find out that the same concept is called with different names by different people, or that different people use uh, call the same thing with different names. When this happens, this creates a, 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 a problem in uh, for an architect to architect a system because when everything has every idea, every entity, typically a noun represents an entity grossly speaking, a uh, verb represents an action on, uh, so a method on the class that represents the entity, so grossly speaking, right? But when you find out that the same uh, verb or the same name refers to different things, uh, that adds noise. So what is the way to handle, the best way to handle that? Uh, 
most developers, most architects for years just try to abstract even further. So I'm not so good at modeling because I'm not understanding enough. So I have to abstract and raise the level of abstraction higher and higher and higher so that I can find a superstructure, a superclass that can see these two different meanings uh, as just a, a special case. And this adds complexity, over complexity. And more importantly, you are missing the point of the top level architecture. So it's very rare, unusual, unlikely that a complex, enter an enterprise, a line of business application, no matter the, 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 the metrics to measure the complexity, just a line of business application that makes a company go, is results from a, a single, unique combination of components, a system. More likely, it's a, a constellation, it's a web of interrelated blocks. So one system is made of several subsystems. One domain is partitioned, even with some overlapping, in multiple subdomains. This is the rule much more than the opposite. And bounded context is just a <coughs> DDD specific term used to refer to a subdomain. So whenever you find uh, noise in the glossary, so ambiguity on terms, you probably are crossing the invisible boundary that separates two distinct bounded contexts. So uh, concretely, in companies, it often happens that different departments use slightly different naming conventions to refer to things and actions. So more or less, in an enterprise scenario, you're going to have one bounded context per department. It's not, it's not a rule, but it's something that happens very, very often. So whenever you find ambiguity on terms, find out if it's you that got the ambiguity. But if the ambiguity really exists, that's probably a concept that belongs to another, that should be just duplicated or isolated in another bounded context. And in this way, a bounded context becomes an area of the domain, a subdomain that needs to be treated independently, can be treated independently, can be developed independently, can be given its own architecture, its own model, its own language. Divide et impera. That's it. Instead of one all-encompassing, fairly complex thing, if you detect, and if you find evidence that smaller pieces can be built together, do that, by all means do that. And each bounded context is a subsystem that you create from scratch. And each bounded context is given its own architecture, supporting architecture. So in a system you can have uh, multiple bounded context, one of which is, say, implemented using domain model, and another one is just plain crude, or a CMS, or CRM, or SharePoint. It depends on what is the expected purpose of that component. So divide et impera, even though it's not explicitly mentioned in DDD talks and books, it's actually underlying the idea of Bounded context. Purpose of the ubiquitous language is having developers and domain experts use the same terminology. It mitigates the risk of misunderstanding and avoid translation between different journeys. It's not theory, it's money. There's money involved here. Oh, this uh, graphical piece of a PowerPoint slide shows you the ROI of DDD. We complain too often about requirements that change frequently. But we probably never spend enough time reasoning about, well, maybe it's because we got it wrong. We got them wrong. It's not important why we, got, we may have got them wrong. Lack of communication, bad communication, poor communication. Fact is, we got that wrong. 
So sometimes changes are not extra features I update, but just, oh, I got it wrong, misunderstandings. And it's, it's a problem, it's money. So a common terminology, strictly business driven, becomes the official language of the project. Uh, people who attended yesterday my sketchy thing talk uh, heard about uh, a methodology that I call UX first that you know, joins together a software architect and a UX architect. But the point is uh, essentially just making, I was just making the point of reducing, finding whatever you can to reduce the risk of misunderstandings. Giving users exactly what they want. If you can achieve this, your budget is in much better shape. So, technically, the structure of the ubiquitous language, words and verbs, that truly reflects the semantics of the domain. So we have a technical <coughs> concepts renamed to the business. So we never happen to delete a record. Okay, it's probably what we do under the hood. But the idea of deleting a record is not, can never be part of the domain language. But it's probably could be something like cancel the order. Because users in their business, they don't delete a record. They maybe cancel an order. Okay, technically it's the same thing. But it doesn't have to show up. Because uh, you never know when you talk to customers and stakeholders, they can misunderstand. Or they can, okay, they can misunderstand what you mean by delete a record. Or worse yet, they can use delete a record to mean something different that for you means deleting a record. So either way, it could be a mess. It is a mess. So actually, if you consider the language spoken by domain experts and the language spoken by development teams, the ubiquitous language is something that joins together but accords higher, far higher priority to the language the terms in the vocabulary of domain experts. Uh, it's not an artificial language, so nobody sits down in a lab and say, oh, let me see. What, we want to have a word like this, a word like that, a verb like this, a verb like that. No, it emerges out of requirements. And it must be continuously validated against users. In the end, we expect such a language to be a glossary that involves all terms in the business that are also that also form an unambiguous, fluent language. Whatever you detect ambiguity, you probably need to split the domain into multiple subdomains and the language, once united language, in multiple sublanguages. Domain experts have expectations <coughs> as well about the language. Avoid terms and concepts missing or not clearly referring to a process or a business concept. The name you choose for a method, for a class, for an enum type, for an element of an enum type becomes important because that helps you understand <coughs> what at some point may be wrong about the code. Uh, trust me, it takes you to the point that you got a call from a customer that says, look, I noticed that when you do this sequence of operations, the wrong data is shown on screen. It means that you go, maybe as you talk, open your Visual Studio project, you reach the file, the involved classes, and uh, reading at commands, reading at class names and method names, you can talk back to the customer using it's the same language. So what we're doing here is we are processing the invoice, blah, 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 blah. And it's the same terminology in nodes. 
So you're talking with a customer using the same language. No chances. You misunderstand each other. So it could be that something went wrong. It could be an implementation detail. It could be a failure in the understanding. It could be whatever. But you have a way to fix it quickly and effectively. All relevant business terms should be defined with the right meaning. So in summary, uh, in a ubiquitous language, in this glossary, the vast majority of terms are referring to business concepts, but well, it might be that it's not surprising that a small subset of that uh, refers to technical actions, like you know, things like typically security, cache, databases. Because at some point, the database still is part of the project, uh, but users, so you need to write some code at some point that saves or reads from databases, but the database concept is not, okay, emerging at the level of users. So in the, in the end, you still need to have things like caching security implemented, and you need to, to name in some way those classes and those methods. So, so this explains why you may still need to have some technical terms, but in general, expect them to be much less numerous than uh, business concepts. <coughs> How would you manage ubiquitous language? Well, it can simply be a Word document or an Excel file or a UML diagram, PC or file, depends on. it's just a glossary. So any way you, you have to save a glossary and to share that within the company is good. Each term should be fully explained and in a way that is understandable by both parties, developers and experts. Keep it up to date. It, it's a never ending work. So there probably never be a time, it never comes a time in which the ubiquitous language is fully defined there is still room for improvement. And more, uh, more uh, beyond this, uh, the language evolves as new insights are gained about the domain, but you also need to match, keep in sync, the language and class names. And uh, all articles you may have read about uh, code readability, uh, refactoring, uh, renaming, not trying to plug you into ReSharper. <laughs> that brings ReSharper <laughs> far from me this. Okay? But renaming is critical. Because it help, it's the way in which you keep in sync your Pictus language with actual classes. Because if you fail at some point, if you miss some changes in the language and not reflect them into the code, you are introducing noise. You are creating uh, as emphatic as it may sound, uh, the trigger, the yeah, the trigger that will uh, originate possibly a big ball of money. Yeah, a ubiquitous language is absolutely critical when you have a lot of complexity and when you are trying to figure out things. So the startup scenario that I mentioned earlier. So here's an example. This is a sort of typical um, requirement you, you may find. Has a register, a customer of the I buy stuff online store, I can redeem a voucher for an order I place so that I don't actually pay for the order items myself. Voucher, for example, is just a term that the business uses. So no other Synonyms like coupon, gift card should be used. Voucher is the only term allowed in uh, documentation, emails, uh, communication, and more importantly, source code. So it's uh, not a mistake because it doesn't compile or it's an er inherent bug. But if you name a method or a class, uh, redeem gift card makes no sense. You have to use redeem and you have to use voucher. That means to stick to the ubiquitous language. And it has to be a strict policy. I would even say that if you have a way 
you would even force this rule as a, a check-in policy rule in your TFS, uh, TMC, or whatever tool you use to save your code. So nearly all tools, TFS in particular, uh, they allow you to define check-in as extra component check-in rules. So you might want to, to try out something to parse any code and in, in some way to try to force this so that you are guaranteed that anything that is checked in is compliant with the user page. Okay, now, let me give you a brief example. Uh, this is a piece of code that represents the description of a sport match, okay? Um, if you suppose that you are writing a scoring application for football, water polo, whatever you want, whatever, pick up any sport. According to fancy technologies in the Microsoft space, like code firms, entity framework, this or that, it could be that, oh, it's a simple scenario. All I need to do is, uh, okay, having, defining a class that I can call match. Uh, team one, team two, oh, the venue, the day, the score, the state of the match. And because you're using, oh, the score, I'm using a value type here. I'm smart. I'm hitting a domain object root class that implements the infrastructure for validation. As a, an abstract is valid method, I can check in any class I derive if the state of the class is valid, which is another pillar of domain driven sense on really smart, really doing a great job here. Oh, I have a behavior is in progress when I just check in the code, the state of the variable here. So I'm smart. I can have an instance of the class dot is in progress. I'm so smart. Yes, but uh, this is essentially an anemic class. Now, not that anemic class is per se a really bad thing, but you are not making any DDD here. That's the point. If you say, I couldn't care less about DDD, I just want to write code that works, Peter, fine, it's okay. It's absolutely okay. But if you want to do DDD, this is, you are not doing any DDD here because you, don't, you are not letting the language of the business emerge. You just are replicating the structure of the relational model you have in mind. What you're doing here is, that, okay, I have a match idea. I know how I would save that to a database. I'm just creating a class that mimics. It's a smart record set. It's a smart active record, period. This is what you're doing here. Oh, and having uh, the score type here, which is a value type, like, uh, like this, still uh, graphics, aesthetics. There is nothing really serious you're doing here. Why? Because, for example, all properties are integers and uh, have uh, open getters and setters. Setters in particular. You can write any number here. And same in match. So, oh yes, I got the point, thanks Dino. Let me rewrite this class. And yeah, at this point you can rewrite the class. Notice, a class like that is what you see in most tutorials and demos using code first. You write a class like that and then you persist the class. Map, you map the class and then have entity framework that do the magic of persisting it. There's no DDD in that. It's not, not because you use value types that you are doing any DDD. So here is a possible way, step two, to rewrite that match class. Uh, now, this is better, slightly better, because, uh, oh, uh, uh, another point that I had in the, here is uh, essentially just the default constructor. So it could be that, okay, I have some initialization here, 
But uh, honestly, that you have a match between home and visitors with no ID hardly indicates that you have a business valid object. Because if you have a match in a scoring system, the match has to be identified in some way, in some system, some backend system, has an ID and has real names for the teams involved, maybe team IDs also. Initialization for current score and to state like this makes sense, but uh, this is not likely returning an object in a business value state. So here is a better way of doing things. So you have now no longer a public constructor and you have a, a constructor that requires you indicate an ID and the names of the teams. And uh, in this particular case, I'm also having uh, contracts to ensure that the ID is alphanumeric and of a given length and uh, team names are neither null nor white space. Okay. If you don't like contracts, you can even use if then statements. It's fine as well. So just check it, input values. This is better because now any instance of the match class can only be created through this constructor and it ensures, because of the checks we make here, that ID and names are valid or at least are not null or totally unrelated. So what else we have here is, oh, we, 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 we made it right, right? Because we have now all private setters. And uh, well, for the few things, a couple of things that may change during the lifetime of the class, the score, and the state, we have set methods. Okay, now, set state and set score. And we also added a little bit of logic here because uh, we say that if the match is scheduled, so if the match is still to start, we automatically set a blank score. Otherwise, we just uh, set the provided uh, state and the score. Yeah, if the match is finished, we just don't do anything. And we set the score only if the match is still running. And we can add even more checks following the business rules. So we have private setters. Oh, yes, that's why we need to have private setters. Because we write separate set methods. Now, this is better but it's still definitely wrong. You are not doing any, you, you, you have probably had a better model, but you are still doing no DDD at all. <coughs> now, what is the purpose of the system of the match class we are creating right away? We want a match class because we want to build a scoring system. So a piece of software that we hand out to the umpire, the referee, or just an assistant, Okay, to just push buttons, has a new goal as a match starts, a match ends, a period ends, or a goal, whatever it is, points are scored. This is what we want. So I said we want to have a match starts, a match finishes, a period ends or starts, goals are scored. This is the ubiquitous. There is nothing here. It's not about set score. Set score is uh, a method that reflects not the business, but the persistence model, which is not bad per se. As long as the code works, it's fine. Okay? But if you want to do it, you want to understand and try to appreciate the real benefits of DDD, and this is a trivially simple example, but project this to the size of a real-world enterprise system. And, you know, it changes completely. So here is step number three. The final destination of the match class. The constructor is the same. ID, team one and team two, 
only have public getters. Current score is uh, uh, as a private setter. We added a couple of new properties to the match is ball in play and current period. Uh, I had in particular water polo because my son does <laughs> water polo actually uh, when I wrote this class. But uh, it, it's easy to, to add similar concepts to, to, to match any sport you like. So in a water polo, it's uh, all scoreboards have a green or red button or uh, light to indicate whether or not the ball is in play. Otherwise, it could be a timeout or whatever. So it's an attribute of the match. So we want to be able to read it. For example, to update the graphics of the scoreboard app. But it's not something we want to set explicitly. The ball is in play as a result of some other action that is performed on the match. Also, the period, one, first, two, three, four, whatever, that's the natural. The, the match is now playing the first period, second period, half time, whatever it is. It's an integer, even though we can consider here, instead of an integer, this is arguable. Okay, it could be that instead of an integer, we just use a, a value type or an enum. Because for the sport we have in mind, we know how many periods are two, three, four, five. But actually, consider that current period, even though it's uh, implemented as an integer, it can only be read publicly. We have no public setter, we have no set method. So the value here is set internally from the logic that public methods develop. So if I write the scoring logic correctly, there is no chance that a value here that is beyond 1, 2, 3, or 4 is saved here. So int 32 here is not perfect from a design angle, but it surely doesn't bring anything wrong into the model. It doesn't enable users, just say users of this uh, app, to do anything wrong with the SDK. Yes? What about the argument that an N32 representing a period could be compared to, say, an N32 representing the score, which is nonsensical in the domain, but then allowed because you didn't use value types here? What do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's arguable. You, you can use here uh, a, a period value type, uh, which in this particular case can, he, can be just the <coughs> first, second, third, fourth. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, and that would be perfect the sense that you are really fully modeling. But even if you keep this to be an integer, because this value is not set explicitly, you only read it. Okay, and when you read the value from, for processing reasons, the value, the, you wanna know if it's the first, the second period, uh, to increment that internally, you need any way to turn that into an integer. So it's uh, about where you want to make the conversion. I agree, ideally this would be a value type, and internally, there is a in private method where we do the increment, uh, we just turn that into, cast that to an integer, plus one, and we're done. Uh, okay, uh, score is uh, the same class as we had, but more importantly, we now have a bunch of new methods. We have start, we have finish, we have uh, goal, we have start period, we have end period, and then we have a bunch of informational methods like is in progress, is scheduled, is finished. And uh, the interesting part of this, before we get into a few details of the source code, I want to show you a unit test you can write on this class, which is the story of the match. I create a new match with this ID, then I start the match, I start the period, I score a goal, I score a goal, end period, start period, score a goal for the other team, and start, and start goal, and what's the score, 3 1? Okay, yeah, this has to be here, actually, anyway. <laughs> this is the expected, so I just uh, swapped the parameters on the R equal. 
that, that, now this is, uh, you know, this gives you a tool to talk to your customers. Because uh, if something goes wrong at some point in the application, and you got a call from the customer complaining about that, you go to, you navigate to the code, critical code, and you read something like this. So you are able to get back to the customer, say, look, what we are doing is this. We are starting a match, we are scoring a goal, this, this, this. At some point you find, you, you are describing the algorithm you're implementing using a language that the user, the, user, the, the stakeholder can understand. So it can get back to you, say, look, this is right, this is wrong. So you figure out immediately whether the problem is just an implementation mistake, just a stupid bang in some method, or it's a logical thing. You just got the workflow wrong. And you do that using a common language with n nearly no chances of further misunderstanding. That's it. Uh, and surprisingly, Implementation of start or all these methods is trivial. It's really trivial. Because start is just this. Just this, nothing special. Finish, just this. But look. The business logic also shows up here through contracts here, or if then else statements, if then true statements. Because a contract requires says, look, check whether the match is in progress and throw argument exception otherwise. So we are, what, what, what I'm saying here is that you can finish a match, but only if the match is currently in progress, the period is the last one, and the ball is not in play. Do they? Oh, okay. You, you mean the exception here? Uh, okay, I just picked it up with the first exception. <laughs> exception plus, okay. You might want to have, yeah, uh, specific, uh, not specific exceptions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's totally right. So it's just, just my, my point. I was too quick in uh, writing the code. So, yeah. This argument exception, okay. But it's, it should be, it, have, it must be. Good catch. A specific exception that indicates exactly what went wrong. So, trying to be try to fi trying to finish a match that, in, that is not in progress. Exception. Uh, I don't know. Uh, invalid current period exception or ball is not in play exception. So you want to have here specific exceptions. Okay, just to 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 make the domain fall. Uh, I'm not supporting here any situation uh, in which the match can be suspended. So the match can still finish when the current code is not the last one. But, you know, you know, we are talking about the business now. We're talking about business. We're talking about rules with code in front of us. So even talking about business, it's easy. Um, okay, I cannot start a match if the match I can only start a match when the match is uh, in its schedule. State. So if the match is already started, I cannot start it again. Otherwise, I throw an exception, which is not supposed to be argument exception, but a much more significant one. Uh, start period. Uh, I require that to start a period, the match is in progress and the ball is not in play. And uh, this is just a feature of code contracts in .NET, I ensure that once this method ends, the ball is in play and the current period is greater than zero. Uh, current period is just incremented now, up to four. Increment is here is an extension method that just does plus one, plus one, up to the specified value. Is ball in play it equals true? So current period, which is implemented as an integer is only set here under my total control. No other people using the public interface of the modem is given a chance to set, to write a value right into the current period property. So 
it would be nice, elegant, effective if I model current period as an enum or a, a, as a value type. Okay, okay. But and I can probably, if I do that, I can probably incorporate the increment logic here as an operator. Operator overloading is allowed in C sharp. Okay, on this value type. So I can do current plus one or current dot next, and the increment logic would be would fit inside of that. That would be even better. But I mean, we are talking about these are improvements from the developer's perspective. From the business perspective, this is more than enough. Because I'm totally sure that nothing wrong business-wise can happen. The value of the current field is totally under my control. So either my logic is wrong, it's flipped, or it's otherwise it works. Uh, and period is similar. It has to be in progress. The ball has to be in play. Uh, the ball is set not to be in play. And if current period is the last one, we just finish the match. And goal, it takes an argument, so an ID of the team who scored the goal. The ball has to be in play, and the match has to be in progress. And then we simply do if ID, if the, the, the home team scored the goal, we just create, that's the immutability of value types, I just create a new instance of score where uh, total goals one are incremented and the new value is stored into the property. So no complex code or even if the logic is sophisticated, I'm uh, building that piece after piece, one little chunk on top of the other under total control of complexity. And tackling complexity in the heart of software, what was that? Just a promise of DVD. Okay, this is a stupidly simple example, but it gives you the sense of the real benefits, the real ROI of domain driven design. And it's not about, it's not primarily about building a domain model. A domain model is not an object model in the sense that it doesn't have to model data, it has to model behavior. Behavior with something, okay, but primarily behavior. Okay, back to PowerPoint. Bounded context. In the beginning, you assume that one invisible, it's, it's safe, it's reasonable to assume one indivisible uh, business domain, and you start processing requirements. At some point, as you proceed, you, you, you learn how the organization works, which processes are performed, how data is used, and how things are called. And sometimes you can find out that different, the same term has different meanings. Uh, yesterday, one of the, uh, I'm not sure if the, the same person is uh, attending this talk as well, but yesterday at the end of my talk on the sketchy thing, the UX first methodology, uh, he showed up and, yeah, we were talking about just this topic, original bounded context and it says uh, well my, in my experience uh, uh, I found a customer that were using the term material in their uh, uh, requirements uh, but you know it, it was uh, really tough for the for the people the developers for the architects to find out exactly what the material was because in different contexts it was meaning an ingredient to build a product and it was four out of six different scenarios. In two, in two scenarios, the material was something yeah, different. This is common. This is common. Uh, a word that can mean, can transmit some meaning automatically to developers may mean something totally different. Oh, account is a term that may mean, to developers it means an account with credentials, but it could also be something like you know, financial list of transactions. So it depends on the context, what it means. So if you read account out of the context, sometimes you, you are led to think, to understand, to form an idea. And when you form an idea, it's hard then to destroy that and rebuild another one. Or you must be ready to do that, exactly that. So when it happens that you find that the same term has different meanings, used by different people in the same organization, you probably crossed 
the boundary of a subdomain. And the best thing you can do is just split the domain in two. Uh, so a bounded context is uh, this subdomain, is the DDD term for a subdomain, which is an area of your application. We did some ubiquitous language, which is typically a subset of the big one you are building. Uh, independent implementation, which could be domain model, crude, CMS, SharePoint, this or that. And an interface, because it's a, a subset isolated in a way, it still needs some interface to talk to other parts of the application. So a bounded context can be a sub-website, or it can simply be a class library, it can be a Windows service. But in any case, it probably needs to, to be invoked and return data to other parts. So an interface, whatever that means, that enables this component to talk to the surroundings is in order. So in the end, out of the DDD analysis, a system results from composition of multiple contexts interconnected using something called a context map, which is, a, a, okay, context map is, a, yeah, just a map that indicates which bounded context. You have a slide in a few moments with uh, uh, arcs connecting uh, nodes of this graph. Uh, each arc indicates the type of communication, the relationship that exists between uh, contexts. OK, uh, so to give an idea of scenarios in which you can have bounded context, imagine that this is the general model that seems to be fine with the application. And you have a development team taking care of some development work. Let's say that this development work involves okay, some components in the overall single okay, domain. You can have also another team that covers another part of the system. And as you can see, it, it may be that you know, two teams end up using entities that have apparently the same name, but not necessarily. They require the same implementation. Uh, if you want a quick example, customer. If the, the team in charge of building the back office needs to know everything, so just needs to, to, to write a UI for some admin people to be able to access the full profile of the customer. So access to just the entire record to <coughs> save on a SQL Server database. But uh, another team writing maybe a front end may just need the name. And, uh, and you don't even need the name to be split in first and last name. It can be just the name as a string. So in this case, you can have just one customer class and maybe work with the two-string method to produce the typical output that a module needs. But in the moment in which another module comes up that needs uh, another form of serialization, what do you do? Uh, string two, string two, or two, string one, or two, or, or you rename so that two string takes a more uh, uh, understandable uh, names. You probably need different customer classes in different namespaces. So whenever there is overlapping, the in overall integrity of the model in the, in the context in which we consider a single model is at risk. So there are several ways in which we can uh, solve the issue. But one is we take these two classes just out, and it's called the shared kernel pattern. So we have a development team one that works on these classes. Team two works on these classes. And both talk, share the common kernel. And in the common kernel, you expose all public methods as they are needed. This is just one possible solution. Uh, another one is introducing bounded context. So 
the development team just sees this part of the system as a separate application. And they create these two, I, mean, I render this with different colors to mean that they name, the name of these classes can be shared with other teams, but they just implement these classes as they need it. And in this bounded context, we also need to add possible connections to the outside world. And the same we do for uh, the other classes. So we have, you know, these classes are duplicated. Well, duplicated. That's a tricky point. They are not, strictly speaking, duplicated. Because they have the same name, but they are expected to have different data to, and to process it differently. Except that the name is different. Uh, I mean, the name is the same, uh, because uh, people behind the bounded context used to call the same thing, a different thing with the same name. It's not, you know, it's a subtle distinction. Oh, you want to be here? It's fine. Okay. Overlapping uh, is quite natural in the, in, the, in the real world. So we don't need to be scared by that and we don't have to think we are not good at devising a model if we find out that there's overlapping at some point which is because, because sometimes developers have a so big ego that we, we think like we've got creating the world and if we miss oh my god that's overlapping here now i've been an idiot no just the real world okay context mapping so it's it's likely to to be in a situation in which uh, you, the top level architecture of what was once a united, all encompassing system is now made of several bounded contents, each of which represents a specific subdomain and each of which has its own implementation, its own architecture, its own language, its own set of technologies. Each of these is independent except that to provide the overall function, I need to interoperate. The context map is the diagram. Context map is another trademarked, DDD trademark term. Uh, is the diagram that provides a comprehensive view of the system. So there are defined in the DDD uh, methodology a few types of relations between bounded context. Uh, one is called customer supplier. And uh, it's uh, indicated with a U and a D at each sides of the arc. U indicates upstream, and D stands for downstream. Essentially, it says that the control flows from the upstream down. So this is uh, the supplier. This is the customer. Translated, it means that implementers of the back office, which is downstream, should be ready to adapt their code whenever something upstream is changed. So people, teams in charge of an upstream bounded context should be free, should be feel free of making changes, even breaking changes, and breaking changes will automatically be managed downward. So these are in a you know, stronger position. I call this as an example core domain. This represents the engine of the application. If something has to change at the core level, every other component, cascading subsystem needs to be updated accordingly. Uh, okay, here's another, just another example. Now, it could be that in a system you need to get services of a subsystem or a system you don't control. Uh, I exemplify this as a weather forecast service. It could be that in your software here it could be imagined as a club site system 
uh, in which you want to play to display your, you know, the people that can book courts and to play sports, they, you, know, you want to provide you know, weather forecasts, but you don't do weather forecasts yourself. You just take this out of an external web service. So you don't control. So the, the weather forecast external module is upstream compared to your code. Uh, sometimes you can consider introducing an anti-corruption layer. <laughs> anti-corruption layer is a proxy. It's nearly a proxy, it's a plain proxy that hides possible changes in the user interface, in the API of the external to you don't control to the club side. So the interface between the proxy, the anti-corruption layer actually, and the club side bounded concept remains constant even when the JSON, the XML, the API exposed by the external side changes. The anti-corruption sits in between and uh, hides okay, proxies, essentially, uh, changes. Um, another final third type of relation is partner. Uh, club side, to exemplify, and back office can be called in a partnership, which means that they have our 50-50. They, they have the same shares in the company, and uh, typically teams behind these two bounded contexts uh, should talk to each other. So no team is uh, uh, allowed to make, uh, to introduce breaking changes without informing, synchronizing uh, with the other team. They are, no. they have the same number of shares. Yeah, upstream, downstream partner. Mutual dependency, but no shared code. Okay, just a, a slide to, to summarize what I just said. Okay, so this is uh, the essence, my, the, the, my personal summary of the main driven design. You've done with DDD analysis. What comes next? Okay, as an architect, uh, you should uh, validate the context map ensure that it's really matching the expectation of the customer and then once the map is approved or it is anyway signed off you focus on <coughs> each bounded context separately and for each bounded context you reason about what is the most effective quickest way to implement it. It could be and this is called strategic design the second part of DVD. So there are, there could be a bunch of good candidate solutions for each bounded context. One could be the domain model pattern that was emphasized in the blue book of Eric Evans. But today it's just one supporting architecture. It could work, it could not work. Could be too complex. Today, the domain model is uh, pushed in a corner because of another pattern that essentially is common sense. It's called a CQRS, Common Query Responsibility Segregation, that says, look, in any system, there are two possible types of action. You can perform a command or you can read, you can write data, executing a comment, or you can, a comment alters the current state of the system, or you can read about the current state of the system. In a classic domain model, read and write operations are performed by domain services and domain model classes in a single environment. And this, uh, and, you know, practice has revealed this, brings to having a lot of one-to-many relationships with uh, a lot of work to populate data queries that go to bring data up to presentation and uh, a lot of complexity also to write. Also, uh, it also raises little issues but with no solutions like uh, suppose you have uh, an order class with details so you need to have uh, typically an items property, collection property on the order class to read the 
items in the order. How would you implement items? I list, but I list has at. Consider that you are returning the order and again that's your SDK. So the order object, the order class, which is part of your public SDK for the domain, has uh, an order class with an items which is an I list. So it has an add. So people, developers, consumers of this SDK can manually, programmatically add new items to an order. Even when they just read the order. This is okay if you are processing the order. But if you are just reading the order and you are returning the order class to the presentation layer, you are returning an object that can be modified and modifying an existing order without an explicit task, an explicit command, is a violation of the logic. Okay, I'm not saying, I mean, you, if you manage to make this impossible from the UI, you have a potential flow, but no real bad effect on the code. But if you review, if you analyze the SDK, well, you find out that your SDK has a design flow. But there is no solution because you, you, in .NET in particular, even if you use a collection, you, you, you can still access the indexer and, and modify. If you use an enumerable, it's the same. You can still enumerate, reach the object, and modify the object. That, that order deals internally. You cannot add, but you can modify an existing one, which is the same. <laughs> You, change, you, you can change the number of items of, of order, the number of uh, books you order. So and this is just a problem that has no solution, except that you separate comments from queries. And when you return orders, you return orders uh, uh, has uh, not in the form of an order class, but in the form of a collection of just plain data. Because on the presentation layer, everything is a string. It's uh, in the command stack that you need to know whether something is a number, which number, a string, a boolean, because you need to perform algorithms. On the way back to the UI, everything can be rendered as a string. So, CQRS is uh, a way to simplify modeling by splitting the command stack and the read stack. And this is emerging, an emerging pattern that you know, is pushing progressively to the corner the classic domain model supporting architecture that still that has to do with domain model, with uh, private sectors, factories, benefits, blah, 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 blah. Mixing multiple architectures in the realm of a single system is far from being wrong. If, you all, if all you need in a particular Bounded context, a crude system, it's fine. Use Visual Basic, use uh, CRM, uh, SharePoint, uh, Google Forms, uh, whatever. As long as you achieve what you need. There's nothing wrong with this. DDD, in the end, is the triumph of the divide et impera approach that made uh, rulers, commanders like Julius Caesar, <laughs> Napoleon rule the world in different times. Uh, so, yeah, this slide I'm just summarizing a few possible architectures from the multi-layer classic, client-server classic, domain model, both with objects and functions, CQRS, plain and simple. Also, the variant of the flavor of CQRS that uses events and event sourcing. In particular, this requires a whole talk on itself, but event sourcing is essentially when you, you use events, you log events instead of writing records. Uh, when you write a, a record, for example, the match record that I talked earlier, uh, in a scoring system, uh, you, you, you receive, there's an event every time that a button is pushed because a goal is scored, because the, the time is, uh, the period ended, and so forth. So if you, in, in a classic relational approach, you have one record for a match, and you modify the state column. But in this way, you lose the history of events. So you, you, uh, unless you create 
okay, an additional database table with events, okay, and by simply overriding the state or a few properties, you lose the sequence of events. So in many business scenarios, tracking events is critical. And uh, when it comes to this, uh, event sourcing means that the, the, the primary data source are events. And then by replaying and parsing events, you build the state of the system for the purposes of presentation or the purposes of other applications. Uh, to finish off, uh, business intelligence is fairly popular these days. And uh, when you, in your company, call people to do some business analysis, the first thing they need to do is uh, accessing, reading your sales data, the data they have to process, and build out of that a model that works with the analysis they're supposed to do. So they need to parse, to read, to process your data, your native data, to build a model that fits their analysis patterns. Uh, it's the same when you use events. Events are a role way of saving data. Just whatever happens within the system. On top of that, you can build just a state that fits your presentation services, but also you can make it easier for business analysts to build on top of raw events, yes, yet another layer of code, model, you know, that fits their needs. So is a, a relational store is effective, but is a, it, it is in a way constraining you to a model, a fixed model. Events are just logging whatever happens in the system and give you the power to write logic that builds on top of the raw data, whatever higher level model you may need uh, for whatever purpose of today and more importantly tomorrow. And uh, when you have events, match starts, match uh, begins, ball is in play, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the problem you have at some point is, OK, I have these events, same match ID. I want to build, OK, what's the current state of the match? So you have to parse, to process all events you have logged. It's called replay of events. And if you have a DDD done properly, all you have to do is, OK, event starts. You call new instance of the match class. What is the first event? Match start. Dot match dot start. The, 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 the period is finished. Dot period. So, so you have a one-to-one -one match between methods on the entity and events. It makes replay of events so trivial, embarrassingly simple, and ridiculously easy and effective. OK, that's, for, uh, that's enough for, uh, for this talk. Uh, you're free to go to have some, uh, some food. Uh, if you don't mind, please follow me. I want to reach 3K followers by the end of the day. Yes? <laughs> I have one question. Sure. Using CQRS, there's a little bit. And here's that. If you need to apply some uh, business logic before returning. OK. Uh, where do you apply that business logic? OK. Uh, this can be done in a couple of ways. Uh, uh, and uh, both work, and probably it's up to you to choose uh, each. One is uh, you have some domain read model in the query stack. So you have a domain model, and in domain model, you have classes like customer order, whatever, with the business logic that you need in that case. Uh, another approach is at the end of the command step, so right after having written changes to the system, you trigger synchronously or asynchronously through queues or even buses, depends on the needs, you trigger a, typically asynchronously uh, an external component that creates a snapshot of data ready for the presentation. So at that point, you can apply business rules that just prepare the data for uh, user interfaces. Now, if uh, the logic to be applied, the, what you call the business logic for the query, 
uh, is fixed in a way, you can go with the approach that you create a snapshot because it's not one script, it's fixed. Okay? If the logic depends on the parameters of the query, okay, you need to have a remodel. And could you place this logic to separate the main service and then when you're querying the like the details, just applying these details in the main service, just applying logic and then throwing Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, 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 in this case, you have a read model, and uh, a read model is just a domain model uh, created in a way that it doesn't have anything that can allow changes. And, okay, if you need to have business also, you create a read model and with its own set of domain services that go down to database, uh, read, write, aggregate data, blah, 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 up to prepare a view model ready for the presentation. Okay? Yes? in mind if you might want maybe to consider anti-corruption layer so you have a, a common interface and hide inside of that the aggregation makes sense or I'm not saying something stupid. Well I mean that sometimes the process can you know last days right and okay. it involves different body context so somehow you have to keep the state of these two different you know, Mm -hmm. Objects coming from different components for states. <coughs> you store sometimes the, the state in this orchestration system, but then it becomes like the, you know, the father of all the bundles. Yeah, okay. I, I think this is uh, addressed in, the, in CQRS by the, 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 the logical construct called Saga. Uh, a Saga is um, a workflow. Essentially, that you start like, like in the Windows workflow foundation, right? So a, 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 a component that has an algorithm that starts and you don't know when it ends. So you know when it ends, but it could be seconds, milliseconds, it could be days, right? And at some point, it starts, calls, whatever. Uh, the saga starts when the process starts from from the UI or, or, or when there's a, a, an event, a user, typical user interface or logical event that starts that. Uh, the saga has to be persisted. Uh, if you use, for example, an event, uh, event bus, you have free persistence. Uh, there are open source frameworks that do that, or you can simply persist that on a database yourself. So you, you just serialize the state of that, so all parties involved, which point each has been, uh, has been reached. And then you have to you know, find a ways to, to, to notify that change has been done, so re re reawake, rerun that, up until you reach an endpoint. Uh, so in this case, the saga is the father, is the unique object, the father, that indicates that is related to the, um, the entry point. So when, when you, you start it, it's given a unique ID, and that's it, and then it can have dependencies. Maybe it can have dependencies on other child sagas, each of which is a, a unique element. Yes, uh, it's, it's a chain. In the end, it can be in complex situation to be, to be just a chain of elements and the serialization uh, is, uh, is, is key. And actually, I mean, it's part of the deal. So having this hierarchy is not surprising as long as you can identify one specific uh, root object, uh, root uh, event, actually, that started that. Uh, yeah, so, so actually it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not surprising to have the world, what you call a super uh, bounded context. Actually it's not like that, I would say it's uh, a super saga, super, super uh, a parent workflow that tracks uh, all events uh, uh, down, down a tree, a logical tree. And, uh, first, yep. I have some misunderstanding about the main service, because like I said before, that the main service stands beside the entity. And they should be also uh, persistent uh, or not. Uh, the domain services are part of the domain layer. Yeah. Domain layer are model and services. Uh, services are just uh, uh, pieces of business logic that requires access 
to external services like web services or database. So, for example, uh, you can have a you have a customer, and uh, depending on the number of orders this customer places, it can reach the level of a gold customer. So, when you populate, because there's a request, a query request, a customer, uh, you want to present in the presentation a flag, a boolean flag is gold or not, because that can have uh, some different colors to display in, in, in the UI. But you need to figure out whether the, the customer is gold or not. But if you just query the customer itself, you don't figure it out. Uh, so you need to run some extra query code, okay, to uh, figure out whether it's gold or not, because it has ordered uh, in the amount of time, blah, 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 blah. So, the customer entity can only have a, a get public is gold property, but the setter of that has to be an injected value in some protected constructor. And uh, the UI calls a domain service, so get me a customer with gold information. So the domain service gets the customer, runs a separate query against the database, figures out whether it's gold or not, and then internally sets the Boolean flag that goes up to the UI, and you know whether the customer is gold, but the logic that retrieves the gold status is not in the class, which remains database agnostic, but the service does the job. So uh, uh, the model, the entities in the model and domain services, they go together. And you typically have a, a, a root, it's called aggregate root classes in, in domain models, the primary classes, and for each of them you typically have a, a domain service class. So you have a customer, you have customer services, and uh, in this class you do all extra queries, or in case of commons, all extra writings that involve the entity and the database. So what about application layer, application? The domain services are orchestrated by the application layer. Yeah. And the application layer receives one, typically, one call from the UI. So the application layer is the, the, the push the button, call a method on the application layer. And then the application layer is where the workflow, the overall workflow for the application is implemented. And this results in a series of calls to one or multiple domain services, absolutely. But then the application layer can uh, uh, do a call to domain services, to repositories? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Orchestrate, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Then the and just... Absolutely, yeah, that's the idea. Okay, thank you.